So uh, would you take out your Bibles? Um, we're going to be just hitting pause on our series through Hebrews, which has been just fantastic, by the way. Andrew did a great job in that particular series. But hitting pause simply because of the time of year it is uh, and kind of turning our attention towards Easter, towards Holy Week. So we're going to be heading to Matthew chapter 21 this morning. And while you turn there, I might pray. Father, thank you for the ways that you've been at work by your Spirit already this morning in our worship as we've uh, uh, joined in communion together. And Lord, I thank you for this privilege, Lord, of, of opening up your Word now. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would breathe life to the words that I speak, that your Word would indeed come alive in our hearts today, that you help us to see things perhaps even that we've not seen before, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord God. Would you be honored in all that we say and do this morning? I pray. We thank you for the power of your word. Let it go forth and accomplish that which you have for it today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm sure that many of us know or appreciate how effective a good advertising campaign can be. Perhaps you've seen, you know, ads on TV or a billboard or something and you find yourself kind of humming along with the jingle or quoting a particular ad or something like that. You know that it's been effective when that happens. And often I find the most effective ones are the ones that are perhaps a little bit different than what you might expect. You may have seen the supermarket, the grocer, Aldi, and often they have these just random ads. And you're watching it, and you don't know where it's going, but then the, the slogan, the catchphrase is, Aldi, good, different. Good, different. It, I guess it's advertising that it's a little bit different than your run-of-the-mill supermarket, but that's a good thing. It's something different than your expectation. It can cause you to think differently. A good advertising campaign just gets stuck in your mind. It might be a bit different, but it's good. So today, of course, as Andrew mentioned earlier, it marks the beginning of what is known as Holy Week. And of course, today it is, of course, Palm Sunday. And this is a time of celebration. It's a time of triumph, you know, when we remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's a good thing for us to celebrate, and it would have been an amazing a spectacle, an amazing event to be part of if we think back to the account that we're about to read. But I want to put to us this morning that yes, it's a wonderful triumph and proclamation, but perhaps a little bit different than certainly what they, the people back then, may have expected. And maybe a little bit different for us this morning in terms of what we can see and take out of it. And I pray that this would be a different kind of holy week for us, that Easter wouldn't just kind of sneak up on us and we, we're kind of just wanting to get through this week so we get to the long weekend, that we kind of go through the motions or gloss over uh, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. No, I pray that there would be something different about this week and about this upcoming weekend, that we would intentionally turn our hearts towards Jesus, that we would intentionally pause to, to reflect and remember both who he is and all that he has done. And so this year, we've, we've thought of doing something a little bit different in the lead up to Easter. And uh, we've endeavoured to get some thoughts together for a little bit of a devotional to just help us as a church focus our hearts, be intentional as we head towards Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. So for those that may be interested... Uh, keep your eye out on, the, on your inbox. We'll be aiming to send one out each evening throughout this week with just a thought and a scripture and a focus for the day, which I think is something good and important and significant about just, just being intentional in that space in the lead up to Easter. So keep your eye out for that. If you subscribe to the newsletter, that'll be coming out during the week. If it doesn't, just... If you don't receive it, you can get in touch uh, with the office or sign up 
to the, to, to the newsletter. Let's read together out of Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. It's account of Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was the, the public proclamation of, of Jesus, of who he was, that he was the Messiah, that he was the King, the one promised to come. And I want to just give a little bit of background and context here because it's important for us to, to perhaps consider or grasp some things this morning. And as we head into to Holy Week, it's important to remember that Matthew in his gospel deemed it so important that he devoted uh, the best part of eight chapters or some 30% or so of his gospel to this one week of Jesus heading towards the cross and then, of course, the resurrection. Now, at this time, uh, it was Passover time, the Feast of Passover, and scholars believe that at this time of year, there could have been around two million or more people crowding into Jerusalem. It's a lot of people, busier than Braidwood, Batemans Bay on the Canberra Day long weekend. It's a lot of people. The city was, was teeming, was heaving. It was, it was all happening, we could say. Packed to the brim. This was quite a time for Jesus to intentionally orchestrate this public proclamation of him as the Messiah and as the King. This was no coincidence, but in fact the fulfillment of prophetic scriptures, pointing God's people to the Messiah. He chose a time when all Israel would be gathered at Jerusalem. He chose a place where huge crowds could see him. And he chose a way of proclaiming his mission that was unmistakable. And what's interesting about how Jesus went about these things on this day is that it's quite different than what we see in many different parts of his ministry. We know that there are accounts throughout the Gospels when uh, Jesus performs a miracle, sets someone free, and then he instructs them very clearly, don't don't say a word, don't tell anyone what's just happened, Don't, don't reveal Or there are times when there's a demonic presence crying out and and Jesus brings deliverance and says, you know, tells the demons to be quiet, to not tell anyone who he is. Because, of course, they knew. But here we see that he's orchestrating, he's overtly displaying, he's proclaiming, he's encouraging, and he's welcoming the response and the praise of the crowd. 
What I want us to see this morning is that the events of Palm Sunday, in fact, point us to Jesus. Not just in a general way, but actually in a very specific way. They point to and reveal Jesus as as he really is. They reveal his mission, his purpose, his rightful position as Savior, as the promised Messiah, and as the royal king. And it revealed all that that entailed. I would suggest that this was a different kind of Passover for God's people. And I pray it would be a a different kind of holy week for us as we turn our hearts towards Jesus and reflect on who he is. So just a few things I want to bring out this morning. As we reflect on the triumphal entry this Palm Sunday, we see a Savior, Jesus as Savior, but a Savior with a different kind of agenda. There is a glimpse here for us of Jesus' mission, that he would in fact suffer and die. Let's read verse 1 again. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem. Now this statement in and of itself is uh, nothing out of the ordinary. and It, it, it expresses a, a fact, a, an account that happened in the narr- narrative. They were drawing near to Jerusalem. However, if we look a little bit deeper, there is a bit more for us to see. If we have a look at chapter 20 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 17, you can turn to the left one page if, if you need to. This is what it says. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, and he revealed to his disciples what would, in fact, happen to him there. I don't know about you, but if I was in that place hearing that, I would say, well, if that's what's in Jerusalem, how about we just hang out here for a little while, Jesus? How about we just kind of hang back here? Like everyone else is in Jerusalem, there's lots of space for us to just be away from Jerusalem. But Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, knowing full well what awaited him there. He wasn't going there with an agenda to bask in the adulation of the crowd. He knew that setting foot in that city would lead to a definitive outcome, being unjustly arrested, tried, mocked, flogged, and crucified. He didn't shrink back from that, but rather he drew near. He leaned in. With this being the moment that Jesus was publicly announced and proclaimed as the Messiah, then part of that proclamation of who the Messiah would be, as we read in some of the prophetic scriptures, Isaiah and other places, we we know that part of that proclamation is that he would be the suffering servant, the one who would give his life. So on this Palm Sunday, we see and remember a saviour who drew near to fulfill a mission, who set his face toward Jerusalem and ultimately the cross, enduring the worst suffering imaginable. We see a saviour who knows and identifies with our pain and our sorrow and is able to stand with us in it because he knows and he has been there and endured that on our behalf. We see a saviour who experienced the cries and adulation of the crowd, yet only a few days later, the rejection of that crowd. Their cries of praise turned to cries of crucify him, all so that scripture might be fulfilled. That the Father's will would be done. That was his agenda as he drew near to Jerusalem. Aren't you thankful that scripture was fulfilled? Aren't you thankful that that was his agenda? To go and to to give his life as a ransom for many, for you and for me. As the events of this week played out, it would have appeared as though things went from triumph on this day to tragedy 
And certainly Jesus' death on the cross to the disciples and his followers would have felt anything but a triumph. But we know that that wasn't the end of the story. His agenda and his mission was indeed to save and rescue and redeem, to deliver God's people, but in a way that perhaps they didn't expect. On this Palm Sunday, as we focus on the triumphal entry, we see a saviour who came with a different agenda, but we see the promised Messiah who brought about a different kind of triumph. How many of us know that expectation or expectations can be dangerous things at times? Now, I, I've tended to think of expectancy and expectations as two different things. Uh, when it comes to things of faith, I've always thought of expectancy as something like, you know, we come to gather to worship the Lord, and there's a sense of, Lord, we know that you're here. We know that you're good. We know that you, you want to move and work in our hearts and lives, and we know that you want to be God in this place. And we just say, Lord, come and have your way. We know that you want to do whatever it is that you want to do. We don't really know what that looks like, but there's that sense of expectancy, right? Whereas expectation, I've always thought of it as more like, okay, Lord, we want you to move, and this is how. The third song in worship, we want you to just kind of break out a little bit in some free... And then when the preaching of the word starts, that's expectation. There's like a preconceived notion of what something should look like. I believe it was Shakespeare who said that expectation is the root of all heartache. And there's certainly uh, evidence and and, uh, scientific evidence of this, that that expectations are a heightened source of stress and conflict, particularly unmet or unfulfilled expectations. Recently, in our house, our second son had had his birthday. And uh, he laid out his expectation Many weeks and months prior, he laid out his expectation of his birthday menu. And uh, it was like breakfast, snacks, lunch, dinner, dessert, what, all, everything he wanted. And uh, he laid out his expectation of, of the presents that he would like. There was a couple of Legos that he particularly had his heart set on. And so he'd speak about his expectation in the lead up to his birthday. And he'd say, now when I get the, oh, I mean... If I get, and we're like, yeah, buddy, you may, you may not get, you know, we're trying to like, you know, not get his expectations up too much. And then Steph and I, we were like, well, I'm glad we got him that Lego set because it's kind of one of those heart-wrenching moments if he didn't. But he'd talk about, build up this expectation. And so there was heightened expectation on the night of his birthday. So much so that at 3.30 in the morning, he comes up, he's like, morning, Dad. It's my birthday. Said, Happy birthday, bud. It's not quite your birthday. You were born just after 6 a.m., so, you know. And he's like, Dad, is it present time yet? And I said, well, no, it's not present time yet. And it won't be for another three hours or so at least. Oh, Okay. I said, look, let's go back to your bed. And so I resettled him. Ten minutes later, is it present time, let Dad? <laughs> no, buddy. Let's, you need to go back to sleep so you can actually enjoy your birthday. I took him back to bed. So 15 minutes later, Dad, is it present time? Yet? There was this expectation. And each time I had to resettle him and take him back to bed, there was this, I think, frustration building. Sadness growing of this unmet expectation of getting his presence right then and now. And I must admit, for his dad, there was a sense of frustration at the expectation of a full night's sleep being unfulfilled and unmet. Eventually, at not long after six, kind of gave in and said, yes, buddy, it's, it's time for presents. And sure enough, he got the Lego. And in that instance, it was very much a fulfilled expectation. But there was a real sense of, of heightened expectation. And had those things not panned out 
the way he wanted, there would have been serious disappointment, I'm sure. At Passover, at this time that we've looked at in Scripture, there was always a heightened sense of religious fervor and expectation, particularly to do with the Messiah. And here on this particular Passover, Jesus, in fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, Behold, your king is coming to you, mounted on a donkey. Can you imagine the excitement in the air as the people see the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures that the king was coming to them? But we think a king riding on a donkey. Surely there must be some mistake. A king coming with a sense of victory and triumph It is the triumphal entry after all, but riding on a donkey doesn't really make sense. I think it's the Melbourne Grand Prix this weekend. It would be a little bit like um, Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen. They're the only two names I know. Rocking up to the Grand Prix in a tour de Prius or something like that and expecting, you know, to have the victory. It just, just looks a bit different. There's something not quite right. But you see, on this occasion... Many people were looking to Jesus with a preconceived notion of what the Messiah should do and should be like. They were expecting him to be a certain kind of Messiah, a political or military king or ruler who would conquer and overthrow oppression. In this case, the expectation was of the Roman oppression being conquered and overthrown and the kind of uh, nation being restored. Yet Jesus came with a different kind of triumph in mind. According to scholars, in ancient times, when kings or rulers came riding on a donkey, it was a sign that they came in peace. The horse was a mount of war, but a donkey was the mount of peace. And so Jesus, in coming riding on a donkey, displayed what he was about, that he was the Messiah who was coming in humility and as the Prince of Peace. And at this triumphal entry, he showed that he came not to destroy, but to love. Not to condemn, but to help. Not in the might of arms, but in the strength of love. His entry into Jerusalem was triumphant in a paradoxical sense because his victory and ultimate triumph would come by way of being nailed to a cross. So for the people, they saw this moment, they recognized it as a significant moment. They knew that this was the fulfillment of prophetic scriptures. Their response tells us that. They burst into, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. That is the good and right response, praise to the king. And this word Hosanna is a Hebrew expression of praise, and it's actually out of Psalm 118. And as part of the Passover feast, the Jewish people would actually sing the Hallel from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. But this particular psalm, these verses that are quoted here, is messianic in nature, so they are in fact recognizing Jesus as the Messiah in their response. And it's a word that means save now. Save now. Make no mistake. This was a genuine cry of, of people desperate for a saviour to deliver them and triumph over their enemies. It was just that their expectation of what that deliverance and triumph would look like was actually different to what Jesus came to bring. His triumph would be over the enemy of sin, bringing salvation to his people through his righteous sacrifice on the cross. I wonder how often we can have a preconceived notion of what Jesus should be like, of what Jesus should do for us. It can be so easy to come to Jesus with our own agenda, of what he might do, of what victory and triumph in our lives or in a particular area of our lives might look like. We can lift up cries of praise, Hosanna, on a Sunday, And then when things perhaps don't materialize or expectations are unmet, we can turn and shake our fist instead. I believe that Jesus, often he works this way, that he wants to bring about a different kind of triumph. 
one where his love and his peace shatters the force of darkness, forces of darkness, where the enemy of sin is pushed back and defeated in our lives because of the finished work of the cross, and where he is able to have his rightful place in our hearts and lives so that he is actually able to work in our hearts and lives, bringing about his change, his purposes, and his abundant life that he came for us to have. This is key, I believe, and this is where I want us to land this morning. As we reflect on the events of Palm Sunday, we see a king with a different kind of reign. Jesus himself proclaimed in in John 18 verse 36 that my kingdom is not of this world. We know that his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. We we know that his kingdom is an upside down kingdom in many ways, that the way up is down, the path to greatness is to serve, that we're called to love our enemies, we're called to pray for those who persecute us, we're called to bless and not curse, we're called to turn the other cheek. That means that the weapons available to us in this kingdom are not just physical material weapons but spiritual weapons, his might and his power at work in us. And as we consider this king who came, Luke's gospel, uh, the account in Luke's gospel, the triumphal entry, it says that as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he weeps over the city. He weeps that there is a, a broken-hearted response. This is a king whose heart is turned towards his people. And he weeps because of the sorrow over the spiritual lostness of the human race and its refusal to turn to God and accept his gift of salvation. He knows that because people are expecting a different kind of king, a political savior, they will ultimately reject him as God's promised Messiah. It was not the kingship of the throne which he came to claim, the political, the national, the military throne that many expected. It was the kingship of the hearts of the people that he came to claim. And it's the same for us today. The battle for the throne of our hearts. Jesus goes on to clear the temple here. And I'll uh, I'll finish with this. He drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers. Basically, these things had been set up as a hindrance, really, to people meeting with God. They'd set up that people could bring an offering, but it had to be exchanged into the temple currency. And, of course, the exchange rate was exorbitant. It was was robbing the people. Or they'd come and bring an offering, but it had to be uh, exchanged into a temple-sanctioned offering. And so people were just being priced out of, like they they couldn't afford to bring an offering. So Jesus comes in and turns over the tables and says, no, get these hindrances to people actually meeting with God, encountering God, get them out of the way. It was the kingship of the hearts of the people that he desired. You know, there are times, perhaps in our own lives, where the Lord wants to come and maybe turn over some of those tables, those things that are in our own hearts and lives that can be hindrances to actually encountering the Lord and actually knowing him, actually walking with him. It's not because he's harsh or anything like that. It's because he's a humble saviour and desires relationship. Desires nothing to get in the way. Desires that nothing would be enthroned as king in our hearts except for him. His appeal was and is to mankind to open their hearts to him. For he is a king who must be welcomed and welcomed as he truly is. So this morning, maybe we could get the worship team to come on up. Will we welcome this king? Will we welcome this king? 
with honour and with reverence. Or, like the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, will we harden our hearts? Will we welcome his lordship, his reign, what he wants to do, even if it looks a little bit different than our expectation? As we begin Holy Week, as we head towards Easter, may it be different than the run of the mill week, but in a good way. May we remember the Savior who came with a different agenda, one of suffering and surrender that ultimately led to salvation. May we remember a Messiah who came to bring about a different kind of triumph, one outworked through love, which in fact brought about the greatest victory at the cross. May we remember a king who reigns with a different kind of reign. One established in our hearts and in our lives. We're going to finish with a, just a song of worship, an opportunity to respond to the Lord this morning. I'd invite the prayer team just to come forward at this point as well. She might like to stand. And if you have any particular needs this morning, any prayer needs, I'd love to encourage and invite you to, to come forward. Perhaps you find yourself in a place today where the expectation and the reality has looked different. Let me encourage you, invite you to come and, and maybe receive prayer, receive encouragement to look to the Lord, to look to the one who came to bring a, a different kind of triumph. To surrender afresh to Him today. So Lord, thank you for this day we thank you Lord Jesus for who you are Saviour Messiah, King Lord of all we thank you that you set your heart to do the Father's will we thank you that the triumph that you accomplished and brought about is one whose effects and ramifications we still know and feel today. I pray that we would not miss it, Lord, because of our own ideas or expectations of what things might or should look like, of how you could or should work, Lord. Pray that you would draw our attention to you, that we would see you as you are. We thank you that you are the King. And I pray that you would be enthroned as King in our hearts. That any of those hindrances, those other things, would be stripped away. That Lord, we would give you permission to turn over whatever tables you need to turn over in our own hearts and lives drive out whatever you need to drive out Lord God so that any hindrance would go and that you Lord would have your reign and your rightful place pray that this this week ahead Lord as we head towards Easter would be a different kind of holy week Lord we wouldn't just kind of race through or go through the motions but Lord, there would be a sense for us of just turning our hearts and our attention towards you, Lord. Remembering you and the price that you paid. Let there be blessing that flows from that to each of us, I pray, this week. We love you. We honor you. We thank you that you have been here in our midst this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen.